Hello, and welcome everyone to another Unchained Labs live demo. My name is Kevin Lance, Director of Marketing for our anal analytical instruments here at Unchained Labs. I'll be your moderator to, for today's event titled Gear Up, the, uh, Gear Up with the Best Tools for Protein Stability on Uncle. So with that title, the goal of today's live demo is to give you direct insights into what we do on Uncle during experiments to screen for the most stable proteins and formulations. Uh, we'll be taking you through an experiment from pipetting to software to analysis. We'll also have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So to ask questions, all you have to do is click on the Q&A button in the Zoom navigation bar at the top or bottom of your screen and type in your questions. We'll get to many of those as we can. Unfortunately, our planned scientist, Bud Halim, got a small cold this week. So today, your star of the show will be Ross Walton, Senior Application Scientist for our Analytical Instruments. Uh, Ross has a PhD in microbiology with a research focus in virology, thermal stability, and structural biology, and is an expert on all of Unchained Labs analytical instruments. Without further ado, I'd like to pass it on to Ross. Uh, hey, Ross, are you excited about today? Hey, Kevin. Yeah, I really am. I'm looking forward to having a chance to show off what Uncle can do and uh, perform some science in front of everybody. Cool. Public science. Always the best. Uh, sounds good. So take it away. Thank you. So this is Uncle. Uncle is an all-in-one thermal stability platform that has a, a temperature control inside of it and three different detection modes that we are going to be using in combination with each other to take a look at a single monoclonal antibody in four different buffers in order to rank their thermal stability. Uh, we're going to be looking at both conformational thermal stability, which is the unfolding of the protein, and the colloidal stability of the protein, looking at for uh, when aggregation happens. We do this with Uncle using several different technologies. First, using the full spectrum fluorescence that's inside of Uncle. That's a way that we can look at the intrinsic protein fluorescence as the protein heats up and thereby watch it unfold. We also use static light scattering or SLS to take a look at aggregation during a thermal ramp. As, it, obviously, uh, as the proteins heat up, they start to aggregate and we can detect that onset of aggregation using static light scattering. The last detection method that Uncle has inside of it is dynamic light scattering, or DLS. And that's used to look at the size and size distribution of protein particles that are in that solution. That we're going to be using as an orthogonal, as both a quality metric at the beginning of the experiment to make sure that the proteins uh, are fairly stable at the beginning or are uh, nice and intact and of good quality. And then also at the end, in order to have an orthogonal metric to look at aggregation. The other thing that Uncle uses, in addition to all those technologies, is this. It's a sample holder, which we call the uni. Now, this thing's pretty small on camera right now. So let me walk on over to our sample preparation bench and give you a closer look at the uni and show you how to load sample. Okay. So here, we've got a closer look at the uni. You can see that it has 16 wells. Each one of these wells is actually a nine microliter cylindrical quartz cuvette that's open at either end. And that's where we put, so all you have to do to load uni is just pipette in sample and then seal it up in its frame. So I'm gonna go ahead and start doing that right now. So just place the uni onto the uni holder right here, holds it at a really convenient angle for loading sample. And I'm gonna start pipetting nine microliters of each of our four samples. And I'm gonna be doing this in triplicate. So just insert the tip of the pipette and to press. That's all you have to do. So Kevin, while I'm loading all these samples, could you think you could talk a little bit about some of the other capabilities that Uncle has? Yeah, sure, Ross. So today, Ross is focusing on a TMT Ag experiment, which takes samples over a thermal ramp, a linear ramp from uh, usually something like 25 degrees Celsius to 95. But another really common experiment that Uncle can shine at is isothermal testing, which helps you test out uh, higher stable temperatures to see exactly how unfolding and aggregation occur over time. So you might hold your sample at 37, 40, 45, or even set based on the uh, onset of unfolding or melting temperature and see what's going on with that full spectrum fluorescence, static light scattering, and DLS all gathered at the same time uh, up to about a week. Uh, beyond isothermal experiments, light scattering also has some pretty cool applications in KD, B22, and G22 applications, which look uh, very specifically at the DLS and SLS readouts of Uncle to understand if your protein is vulnerable to self-self interactions in the formulation that it's in. So KD and B22 are useful for dilute protein concentrations, 
you know, 10 milligrams per mil and below for an antibody. And G22 is particularly chosen for high concentration antibodies. So something in the neighborhood of 50 milligram per mil uh, all the way up to, you know, 100 milligram per mil and beyond. So very useful if you're formulating for say a subcutaneous injection. Um, but that looks like Ross is done pipetting, so I'll hand it back to him. Thanks, Kevin. So now that we've got our uni all loaded up, we're gonna be getting the uni into its uni frame, which is what we use to hold on to things uh, before we put it into uncle. Let me get that on camera a little bit better. There we go. So you can see that the uni frame, bright blue, has letters on it to, dictate, to tell you which, each, which well is where, and then also has these silicone gaskets on the top and on the bottom. So those are what seal either end of those, uh, those wells, those cylindrical quartz cubettes, because after all, it is open at either end. So I'm gonna go ahead and just get it snapped in place. So line up the frame like that, pull it away from the holder and close it up like you mean it. So that's all there is to it. Sample is ready to go in place. All those samples are in there, nice and secure. And when I say secure, I really mean it. I've actually dropped unis before and they've been just fine and I've still been able to do experiments with them. Um, if you ever tried to do something similar with a plate, you know how much of a pain that can be. Now I'm gonna walk on over back to the instrument and I'll show you how to set up an experiment. And I'm going to share my screen so that you can see the Uncle Client software. So this is our Uncle Client software. This is the software that, we're, that you use to control Uncle and basically do everything you need to do, set up an experiment uh, and all the other things that uh, are necessary. So we'll go to applications and now just go to TM TAG with optional DLS, which is the experiment that we're gonna be running. This is what we typically use, but 90% of our customers are using to look at protein thermal stability. Click on that, click on the project folder where we're gonna save everything. And now let's give this run a name. We'll call it live demo. Ross. Okay, now we pick which sample set we're going to use for this particular demo. Now, earlier I said that we're gonna be looking at a monoclonal antibody in four different buffers. And here we have exactly that two milligrams per milliliter of our monoclonal antibody in 12.5 millimolar histidine buffer at pH 6.2. Now the di only difference between these four samples is what excipient or what additive we've used in these samples. So in one of them, we have no excipient. In one of them, we have 150, mol or, uh, 150 millimolar, excuse me, sodium chloride, 150 millimolar arginine, and then finally 150 millimolar sucrose. So now we highlight all four of these samples and just hit replicate. And that adds the samples that we have listed over here on the left side of the screen to that sort of virtual uni, you can think of it, right there on, uh, in the middle of the screen. And you can see the list of the triplicates all right next to each other there on the right. Now that we've got, now we've told the software where all of our samples are in the uni, we can hit finish. And now set up the actual experiment. We're gonna be taking a look at DLS at the beginning of the thermal ramp and at the end of the thermal ramp. So we'll leave those two checkbox marked. And you know, this is just our default acquisition settings for DLS. I'm gonna change the start temperature to 15 degrees. Uncle can do a thermal ramp from 15 degrees up to 95 degrees Celsius. So we're just gonna look at the full range of this thermal ramp. Three seconds of incubation at the beginning of the experiment, just holding it at that 15 degree temperature, holding samples at that 15 degree temperature, let everything equilibrate. And we're gonna do a ramp rate of one degree C per minute. So typically when we're doing experiments, we use uh, somewhere between 0 0.3 and one degree C per minute, depending on how many samples we're looking at and the needs of those specific samples. We can also change the plate hold, which effectively changes how many times a given sample is exposed at a, uh, at, during an experiment, exposed to the various lasers in an experiment. We typically recommend somewhere between one and two reads per degree Celsius. So I've just set the plate hold to 50 seconds and that you know, decreased the reads per degree Celsius from 1.6 down to 1.2. And the last box you have to take a look, we have to take a look at here is the total duration of this experiment. So uh, this was gonna take about an hour and 42 minutes because of looking at DLS and then at that particular ramp rate we're using. And that's a 
pretty long experiment, I think, you, uh, for trying to do in a live demo, but a pretty short experiment when you know you have to screen a bunch of samples. So I think we're just going to uh, start the experiment, and then I'll be able to show you some data on the, of these samples that I've ran a little bit earlier. Now hit apply, and we're going to load samples. So door is opening. Let me walk around to the front of the instrument and load up our uni. All right, door is open, uni goes in, align the notch with the little peg in the back there, gets held in by magnets, and then put the black plastic frame all over the top of the whole thing. All right, looks like everything's nice and secure. Let me go around, like, around to the front of the instrument, or in front of the computer, excuse me. And close the door. Okay, door is closed, experiments are all, or samples are all loaded. So now just hit quick start and uncle's off to the races. And rather than stare at this for the next hour and look at you know, just uh, samples being read, I'm gonna open up uncle analysis and show you some of the, uh, some data from these sets of samples that I just prepared a little bit earlier. So first off, let's take a look at the melting curve for our histidine alone sample. You can see all three of those replicates listed right here. We can highlight all of those to take a look at them together and add a TM drop line. And you can see that the TM drop lines overlap really well for those replicates. And if you look down here in the table, you can see that the average TM, the average TM1, excuse me, which is this one right here, is at about 72 degrees with excellent percent CVs. TM2 uh, is shown right here at about 82 degrees with again. Zero, less than 1% CV for those. So this is really reproducible data, very, uh, very nice, very clean results. Now, since we're trying to rank the thermal stability of these different buffer, of this uh, antibody in these different buffers, let's compare two of them. So let's take a look at the histidine sample uh, and then what happens when we add arginine. Excuse me, there we go. So now you can see that what happened when we added arginine to the buffer is the TM1 shifted from 72 degrees here down to about 68 degrees here. So that means that the, uh, that the arginine, these, this monoclonal antibody in arginine is slightly less stable than it was without any, uh, with just in the histidine buffer. What's another thing that's kind of interesting is that even though the TM1 shifted by four degree, about four degrees Celsius, TM2 didn't shift very much at all when we added this excipient, which is kind of an interesting phenomenon. We can also take a look at the sodium chloride sample. And there we have a uh, TM1 that's right in between the TM1 for the arginine sample in light blue here, and the uh, TM1 for the histine, uh, histine sample, which is here, this sort of peachy color. And all of the TM2s are actually pretty close together. So if I were you know, analyzing these results uh, Right off the bat, it's definitely be focusing more on TM1 than on TM2. So now that we've looked at conformational stability and comparing some of these different samples, why don't we look at their colloidal stability, basically looking for aggregation. So we'll just go back, right back to our histine sample alone. Now turn on our static light scattering, our SLS of the 266 laser. So we turn that on and we can also turn on the TAG266 drop line. And when we do that, you can see first that the SLS is kind of a gradual sweep rather than a sudden increase uh, in fluorescence. So this is aggregating a little bit more on the slower slide. And you can also see that that aggregation kind of starts at about the same time as that TM1 is starting to happen. So where, uh, so that initial unfolding behavior is really closely connected with that onset of aggregation behavior. So those two events are most likely linked. And if we wanna compare the uh, relative colloidal stability of two different samples, we can do that pretty easily too. Just have to turn off the fluorescence. We'll turn off the TM. And now let's take a look at what happens when we compare the colloidal stability, uh, look, you know, checking for aggregation of the just histidine buffer and of the sodium chloride buffer. And when we do that, we've got sodium chloride here in dark blue. We've got the histidine in that peachy colored. And you can see that by adding sodium chloride to this buffer, we induced aggregation at a much lower temperature 
uh, than it did in the buffer alone. Uh, and the degree of aggregation looks a lot higher because that intensity signal off that 266 laser in the sodium chloride buffer is a lot higher than it is uh, in that regular, just the histidine alone buffer. Now that, that difference becomes even more apparent if we look at the static light scattering of our 473 laser. So there you can see there's an even bigger difference between the uh, histidine buffer alone and the sample that contains sodium chloride. You might be wondering why that is. Well, one of the ways we can figure, find out why those intensities are so different is by taking a look at DLS. So I'll toggle to the DLS tab. And now we're just looking at that antibody in histidine buffer at 15 degrees Celsius. And you can see that the Z average is about between nine and 10 nanometers, which is what we expected for this protein. And the PDI is less than 0 0.1, indicating it's nice and monodispersed. And you can see based on just looking at the intensity distributions and the mass distributions, that's the case. Now this protein is a very happy protein. It's monodispersed, there's no aggregates. It's very nice uh, and clean and a good sample to be doing thermal ramps on. Um, if the sample had already aggregated, there'd not be not much point in running a thermal ramp on it. We can also take a look at the end of the experiment and see what happened. So what happened, I think you can see from the numbers, is that the Z average increased because aggregates started forming in this sample uh, after it heated up, and the PDI also increased, which shows that the, uh, again, the aggregates started forming. And you can see from the intensity distribution and the mass distribution, same thing. So aggregates happened after the end of this experiment. But what I really want to take a look at is comparing the uh, histine buffer at 95 degrees to a sodium chloride sample at 95 degrees. And when we do that, you can see that the aggregation in that sodium chloride buffer was much more severe. There's much larger particles present in the sodium chloride buffer at 95 degrees than there was in the histidine buffer at 95 degrees. You can also see that the Z average of the sodium chloride containing sample will actually exceeded the maximum detectable range for DLS. It's bigger than a thousand nanometers. So there's really, so that means that there are some really big aggregates that formed in this uh, sample when we added sodium chloride that did not form when it was just buffer alone. So based on that information, you can actually, you can make a lot of uh, interesting comparisons and rank the relative stabilities of these, these different buffers that we've been looking at today and figure out you know, which one is, might be the best candidate for a future, uh, for you know, continuing formulation studies. That is taking a look at these, I think that's taking a look at all of the data I wanted to show. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And I think that we've probably got some questions that have come in from the audience, Kevin. Uh, so why don't we go ahead to try answering some of those? All right. Okay, I'm back. Uh, sure, yes. So we definitely have some questions that have come in. Uh, I'll, I'll start reading those off in a second. Uh, but first, I want to say thank you, Ross. Uh, this is a really nice, entertaining uh, presentation of what Uncle can do. It really showed how you can just walk up and run experiments on Uncle. Um, and so to recap with Uncle, you can assess protein stability with intrinsic fluorescence and static light scattering uh, and DLS, uh, which you've done here in a variety of formulations. So as a reminder for everyone in our audience to ask questions, all you have to do is click on that Q&A button in the Zoom navigation bar at the top or bottom of your screen and ask those questions. All right, first one here at the top of the list, how long does an experiment take and what ramp rates are typically used? So the length of the experiment is gonna depend entirely on what that ramp rate is. So that's sort of answers the first part of the question. You saw that with that one degree C per minute, about an hour and 45 for uh, an experiment. And if you do a slower ramp rate, obviously the experiment takes a little bit longer. The range of ramp rates that we're typically uh, suggest is somewhere between 0 0.3 and one milligram per, uh, sorry, 0 0.3 and one degree C per minute, pardon me. And that uh, is pretty good for, you know, there's a range there and takes a little bit of, you know, sort of, um, figuring out what's optimal for a given set of samples. But normally we've seen most customers settle on about 0 0.5 degrees C per minute, and that works reasonably well for, for most people, but it's something that can be optimized, can be changed. And as you saw, is very easy to change in the software at the beginning of the experiment. All right, and then uh, the next question here, what concentration of protein is needed for an experiment on alcohol? So for a TMT-AG experiment of a monoclonal antibody, 
we use somewhere between 0.5 milligrams per milliliter and 300 milligrams per milliliter. Some of the other applications, I think you were talking about uh, KDB22 and G22 experiments uh, while I was loading samples, those obviously have their own specific needs for concentration. But for the experiment that I just ran, 0.5 up to 300, we've tested uh, that full range. Uh, and then another question on unfolding, and then we'll pivot to a, a DLS question that came in through the chat. Uh, but first, the unfolding question, mm -hmm. is Uncle limited to use with proteins showing a fluorescence redshift during heating? Because I noticed all those curves trickled up indicating a redshift. Is that something that you need to have? No, it's not. So uh, that's one of the nice things about Uncle's analysis is that it's extremely flexible. So the default analysis for looking at protein unfolding, looking at uh, trying to find those, those melting temperatures, those TMs, uh, is using what's called BCM or barycentric mean. And that analytical tool is sensitive to redshifts or to blue shifts. So really, no matter what a protein is doing, um, as long as that, fluoresce that intrinsic fluorescence behavior is changing, we're able to detect it and be able to figure out the TMs as appropriate. All right, a couple of DLS questions now. So with DLS at the initial and final temperature of a thermal ramp, uh, what, can we, what can we learn from those two data points? So the initial DLS is really useful for checking and making sure that a protein is of good quality before you start an experiment. Now, I'm sure everybody's had the experience of getting a protein, it's in a buffer, and it's already aggregated before you even heat it up. I know I've had that happen to me a bunch of times. I'm sure it's happened to everybody else. And once a protein's already aggregated, there's really not much point in running a thermal ramp. It's not gonna tell you anything particularly useful. So that initial quality check is really important and really useful to make sure that yes, your protein is you know, stable, at least at room temperature in that buffer at the beginning of the experiment. Then that final uh, DLS read that we're using, that 95 degrees Celsius in this case, is first as an uh, orthogonal measurement of aggregation, checking to see, yes, you know, when you see an increase in SLS signal, did my sample aggregate? And it's also useful in those cases where you don't see an SLS signal and you just need to you know an extra little bit of confirmation that, yeah, your, your protein really did not aggregate during your entire experiment, during the experiment. And the other thing that you can use that deal, final DLS read is comparing the extent of aggregation between two samples, like we did between the, uh, the histidine sample and the sample that contains sodium chloride. If a protein uh, forms large aggregates after heating in a buffer, that can sometimes be a much bigger problem than if it only forms slightly smaller aggregates. There was a two-part question that came through the chat. Um, I'll, I'll tackle the first one and the first part and give you the second part. So the first part is, uh, what does it mean when looking at the DLS results in the analysis software if a uni well is red, color red? Um, so that's just indicating on the heat map of the results, if there's a large diameter, that can often be red, or uh, if there's kind of an ideal diameter, that would be green. So it's kind of a green, yellow, red, you know, stoplight sort of readout. Uh, it's something that you can see in the software interface where you set those thresholds for size and where you want the colors to change. And the second part of the question, uh, for I hand it off to you, Ross, is uh, why is there sometimes no readout for a final DLS reading? What's going on there with the sample at that 95 degrees C temperature? So the most common reason that there's no read is because the static light scattering signal that, or the dynamic light scattering signal that we're getting off of the, the sample just is so noisy and so bad that it can't be interpreted by the software. And that's usually because there are some really huge aggregates in that sample, at which point really all you're getting is sort of just meaningless noise. And the software knows that there's nothing that it really can, can do with that um, amount of signal. It's just meaningless. So it just says, you know, no results. And uh, yeah, that most happens when there's some really big aggregates that are way outside the, the range of detection for DLS. Uh, DLS can only really, uh, looks for you know, upper limit for its size detection is a thousand nanometers. And if you have particles that are bigger than that, it doesn't really, it's not really useful. It's not really um, gonna be able to quantify anything, but it still tells you that that sample is really badly aggregated. Yeah, it's kind of one of those laws of physics types of things for DLS, for those extremely large aggregates, kind of good mm -hmm. to know that um, when sort of the laws of physics no longer apply for DLS, then uh, it's good to, to have that data come out. Um, another uh, question. Yeah, it's a bit like, you know, trying to use a ruler, trying to use a 12-inch ruler. Oh, sorry. It's a bit like trying to use a 12-inch ruler to measure the size of a building. It's not really appropriate. So another question coming through the Q&A uh, panel. How many samples can you run at a time? Um, do you run one sample tray per run or 
I guess you could talk about how many samples per uni and how many unis you could fit. Yeah, yeah, I can do that. So uh, each uni has 16 wells in it and you can put you know, a different sample in each one of those unis if you want, or each one of those wells in a uni if you wanted to. And then per experiment, Uncle can hold three unis. So that works out to 48 pos wells and you can mix and match, do replicates, do whatever you need to with those 48 samples. Uh, during a thermal ramp, could you compare how SLS and DLS might perform in terms of a readout? So uh, during a thermal ramp, um, we actually have done that with Uncle. So Uncle can do DLS measurements during a thermal ramp and it can do SLS measurements during a thermal ramp. There's different experimental runs, but when we have done that test, what we found is actually that the static light scattering is a much more sensitive detection method than the, the DLS. So we tend to prefer just using SLS to look for aggregation. We see it happen uh, a lot faster. It's more sensitive and gives us more useful results. Uh, what can Uncle do for stability and formulation work on viral vectors like AAV? This is uh, it, it, pretty interesting what happens with AAVs relative to what happens with proteins. So uh, viral vectors like AAVs or you know, really any viral vector, you can sort of think of it as a protein shell with a little bit of DNA trapped there in the middle of it. And what happens when you uh, thermally ramp that protein shell, that viral vector, is that in some cases, the DNA actually gets ejected from that viral uh, shell. And you know, once the DNA has been ejected from the capsid, it's not really a virus anymore. And uh, the nice thing about using Uncle is that it has two different lasers, that 266 laser, which we're using for intrinsic protein fluorescence, and it also has a 473 laser, which you can use for exciting a, uh, actually a whole different, a whole bunch of different fluorescent dyes that you can do for use for lots of different purposes. People are probably familiar with Cipro Orange as a fluorescent dye for looking at uh, protein unfolding that you can excite with the 473 nanometer laser and then use Uncle's full spectrum uh, detection to find that emission uh, as well. But you don't just have to use Cipro Orange. You can also use a uh, nucleic acid binding dye called, like, for example, Cyber Gold. Uh, if you use Cyber Gold for this instance, mixed with an AAV or viral vector that you then heat up and the capsid gets ejected, that nucleic acid binding dye will bind to the genome that's gotten ejected and the fluorescence signal will increase. So you can use Uncle with this dye and the 473 laser in order to track genome ejection from a viral vector during a thermal ramp. You can also use Uncle to look at the stability of the capsid proteins during a thermal ramp using that 266 laser. So you get two different, mm, call it flavors of thermal stability for a viral vector just from a single instrument. Ooh. Uh that's uh, pretty useful, especially when it, you consider that AAV has so many complex things going on, having more than one tool to look at it makes sense. Uh, another question coming through the Q&A, does Uncle have ISO compliant uh, DLS uh, analysis? Yes, it does. Okay. Uh, and then we'll, I see another one coming I don't, through. Do you think that. I need to elaborate on that? I no, I mean, it's, yeah, yeah, sure. Yes, it does. Um, so another one coming through the chat is, uh, it's a little bit more of a complicated question. Uh, so with the change in TM1 going between different buffers, uh, does the data give any further information about what structural changes uh, might be attributed to TM1, what might, might be causing the differences between the samples? Uh, the, yeah, interesting question. I, yeah, I can have, share my thoughts on that too, but Ross, what do you think? Yes, so... I mean, it's going to depend a lot on what you already sort of know about the structure of a protein. So, you know, if you see two TMs and TM1 shifts in an enzyme, that tells you something slightly different than if the uh, same thing happens in a monoclonal antibody. So it's really this combination of knowing a little bit about the structure of your protein and seeing the uncle results and figuring out where those two things fit together. Um, I think, Kevin, do you want to go into a little bit more detail on probably what happened with this? Yeah, I would say that that's a, uh, I agree with everything you said. And I would just say um, the other places to start to look would be being very clever with the experimental design, uh, running you know ranges of uh, your different excipient concentrations to look at ionic strength uh, and see if that's the impact or if the impact is more about hydrating your protein uh, instead of shielding ionic charge, um, those kinds of things. So it's more about experimental design at that point um, and using that to understand what's going on exactly with the behavior of your protein. 
Uh, we have one more question that popped in the Q and A. Uh, can you look at protein protein interactions with the uncle? So, yes, in some ways you actually can't. So, uh, first of all, you know we can use if it's self self interactions, you can use something like KD and B22 or G22 to look at that. If you've got a mix of two different proteins that are interacting with each other, you can do what's called a thermal shift assay, uh, which is a little bit more complicated. Requires you know combination of ligands and some dyes and uh, becomes a little bit more complicated. So if it's something that you're really that uh, was, a, I think that might've been a customer question. If it's something they're really interested in, they should reach out, contact us directly and we can help explain that process to them. Yeah, yeah. And I'll say that thermal shift assay that you mentioned is something you can do with a protein and a small molecule ligand. But if you're um, clever with your experimental setup and you do a range of mixtures, it's something you can uh, try taking a look at for um, protein protein as well. So, okay. If you, thanks everyone to uh, Ross again. Thanks to our audience for a kind attention today. If anyone thinks of more questions or if you're just looking to chat with us, uh, please reach out to info at unchainlabs.com. Uh, thanks again to everyone and have a nice day.